Those mage seekers in Demacia were horrible, but I finally made it to the Bandlewood to sell this crystal orb. Captain Timo on duty! Ah, aren't you the cutest little thing? Do you happen to know where I could find the Yordle Vigar? He's supposed to put. Bring on the bad guys! Oh, I, I'm not bad. I'm just selling. Never look at Tulip in the eye. What Tulip? Oh. <laughs> please, I just. Ready? <gasps> Aim? Oh no. Wait, please! Fire! Don't worry. He'll be fine. I've actually never heard of a Yordle killing anyone, although he may be led astray by myriad wonders and end up lost in a dream. Today we'll be answering the question, what the heck is a Yordle? To better understand Yordles, we need to know where and when they come from. For our story does not begin in the spirit realm where Bandle City is located, more on that later, nor even on land in the physical realm of Runeterra, but the oceans, which were home to civilizations far older. In the depths of what is now the Guardian Sea, a great city once stood. It was there that the Yordle Fizz made his home. Even though he was not one of them, they treated him as an equal. Quick note, this is not the first mention of a city underwater. Pike is always mentioning a swimming city. I do think we'll eventually see an ocean themed expansion where we flesh all this out, and how sea monsters around Bilgewater appear to be much smarter than people are led to believe. I do have a theory video covering that on Pike and the sea monsters, but back to Fizz. The world was changing, the oceans were growing warmer, emboldening fierce predators to rise up from the deepest trenches. Other settlements had fallen silent, but the rulers of the great city could still not agree on how to deal with the threat. Fizz pledged to roam the seas in search of survivors, or anyone who knew what had happened. Then, one dark day, the Gigalodons came. These huge dragon sharks stunned their prey with fell shrieking, and the avenues of the great city were soon clouded red. Thousands died in a matter of hours, the immense bulk of their killers crushing towers and temples in a monstrous feeding frenzy. Scenting blood in the water, Fizz raced back, determined to join the fight and save the city. He was too late. There was nothing left of the city to save. When the debris finally settled, not a single living creature remained, nor any stone upon another. Alone in the cold depths, Fizz sank into a mournful despair as his Yordle magic began to fade. He let himself be carried by the currents drifting in a catatonic torpor, dreaming away the millennia. Sometime later in the Freljord, before the War of the Three Sisters, perhaps even before the demigods themselves, we see a Yordle named Nar with his family and tribal drawings on the walls of caves. Many believe Nar is just muttering random words with no meaning, but that is actually not the case. Una Lega means he wishes not to be distracted. In the past, others have confused this with which means he would very much enjoy a hug. Best not to confuse the two terms, for when he becomes angry, he transforms into a massive beast bent on destruction. A young Yordle with boundless energy, Nar and others like him lived openly among the hardy tribes of the Northlands. Though barely big enough to leave footprints in the snow, his temper rivaled that of beasts ten times his size, and he would erupt with a babble of curses the moment anything went to miss. For this reason, he felt more kinship with the great and wise creatures who kept their distance from mortals. To Nar, they looked like overgrown white furred Yordles and that was good enough for him. We would refer to these creatures as yetis. Over time, Nar could sense change coming to the land. The sky seemed darker, the winds felt colder. The mortal tribes who had once forged together now appeared to hunt each other. Nar believed the yetis would know what to do. Nar would go to them. When he finally found them, he also saw more mortals than he could count. This was exciting, but no one else seemed too happy about it. Then the ground shook and split apart. For the first time in Nar's life, it seemed as though everyone else was throwing tantrums, but the monster's arrival silenced them all. Heaving itself up from the newly opened abyss, it bore huge horns, whipping tentacles, and a single eye, burning with strange light that made the fur on Nar's back crawl. While some mortals fled at the sight, he began to feel an odd pain in his chest. 
It was like the thought of losing his boomerang or never being hugged again. This horrible thing wanted to hurt his new friends, and this made him angry. In that moment, Nar truly raged. All he could see was the monster. In a flash, he was in the air, leaping toward it. In one paw, he grasped a snowball, or so he thought. In fact, it was a boulder plucked from the mountainside. For Nar had grown as large as the big white yordles. He would send this monster back to where it came from by walloping its face. But the blow never landed. Nar felt a chill colder than any winter, one that seemed to turn the air itself into ice. Truly, this elemental magic froze him in place, fighting through his shaggy fur. Everything, including the monster, became quiet. The Yordle's strength and anger melted away. A deep tiredness crept into his limbs, and he fell softly asleep. This was the war of the Three Sisters with Cassandra, the Yetis, and the eruption of the Watchers into the Material Realm. If you want to know more about this, I'd recommend my video covering how Lysandra doomed all of Runeterra. What happened here is Lysandra froze the Watchers in true ice, and Nar was accidentally caught in the crossfire. Nar napped for a long time, until he finally awoke and shook the frost from his shoulders. Even now, Nar has no grasp of what took place that fateful day, nor how he escaped. He simply marvels at the world before him, with so many oddities to collect and places to explore. Now even though our story begins in the oceans, then making land in the Freljord, Nar and Fizz did not come from these places, for all Yordles hail from a place in the spirit realm known as Bandle City. Opinions differ as to where exactly the home of the Yordles is to be found, though a handful of mortals claim to have traveled unseen pathways to a land of curious enchantment beyond the material realm. They tell of a place of unfettered magic where the foolhardedly can be led astray by myriad wonders and end up lost in a dream. In Bandle City it is said that every sensation is heightened for non-yordles. Colors are brighter, food and drink intoxicates the senses for years, and once tasted will never be forgotten. The sunlight is eternally golden, the water is crystal clear, and every harvest brings a fruitful bounty. Perhaps some of these claims are true. Or maybe none, for no two tale tellers ever seem to agree on what they actually saw. Only one thing is known for certain, and that is the timeless quality of Bandel City and its inhabitants. This might explain why those mortals who find their way back often appear to have aged tremendously, while many more never return at all. While Yordles hail from Bandel City, they do not originate from there. In fact, long before the Yordles called Bandel City home, there was only a tree. No one knows why or when, but it grew to fill the space behind reality, unfurling its branches into the spirit realm until it had no clear beginning or end. It simply was and always has been. It is known by Yordles as the Bandle Tree. Now we do have a candidate for the Bandle Tree's actual origin, and that is the Glade. Bandle City is already a bizarre place that defies magic, where time was meaningless and the natural laws of the material realm did not wholly apply, and yet the Glade was a place stranger still. It existed long before Yordles came into the world, and it was perhaps the Glade that Bandle City itself sprung, a place of raw primordial magic. It was hidden away so deeply that no Yordle had ever found it, until Lulu was guided there by a fairy named Pix. Here, Lulu's own magic became wildly magnified. Laughing joyfully, she discovered she could reshape her surroundings at will, as well as alter her form to whatever she wanted. Lulu didn't know if Pix had brought her here because he saw in her a kindred soul and simply wanted someone to play with, or if the Glade needed her for some other purpose, but she fell in love with it instantly. Her life became one of endless creation and play, and she soon forgot anything else existed. When finally she remembered, it was like waking from a dream. She found herself back in the material realm, not knowing if a single day had passed or a thousand years. To her surprise and joy, she found that some of her newfound power had come with her, allowing her to make small things large, change colors to those more pleasing to her. To Pix's endless amusement, she turned the mightiest beast into tiny, bewildered frogs or squirrels with a flick of her staff. Maybe we'll explore this more in the ride of Mamo, 
although I've never been one to mind when some things just stay a mystery. Regardless, it is unknown what the exact nature of the glade is. However, the bandle tree appears to have grown from it, filling all available space behind reality. We don't know anything beyond that. Yordles just originated from somewhere in the spirit realm before gathering around the bandle tree. So let's get into just what the spirit realm of Runeterra really is. The spirit realm is a parallel pocket of existence to the physical realm of Runeterra. It is the home and origin place of the spirits. While most if not all do seem to be able to cross into the physical realm of mortals, some only visit for a short time. Very little is known of the spirit realm, usually told through tales and myths. And spirits themselves are pretty interesting and a very broad term, honestly. We have the Yordles which we're talking a lot about in this video, but there's also the demons which come from the spirit realm. All of the demigods in the Fraljord are from the spirit realm. You have characters like Kindred which is considered the death spirit of Runeterra. And all of these spirits from the spirit realm appear to have everlasting life. None of them will ever die, including Yordles, demons, Kindred, death and aging are not a thing to them. And that's why you have all of the Vestaya live a very long time, because all Vestaya originate from Vestaya Shire, who took the magic of the spirit realm into themselves to fight against the Titans during the Titan War. That's a long story, don't really worry about it, but know that Vestaya are kind of part spirit, half spirit, which is why they live a long life, but they're not full spirits, so they're not immortal, like Yordle's demons or demigods are. In terms of the spirit realm itself, it seems to be split into smaller regions or realms and it's unknown just how separate these places are. But the spirit realm is big. You have obviously Bandal City, but you have a bunch of different death realms depending on where you come from. Ionia kind of has their own where a fox spirit will guide you. Chemivorians with Viego and Callista have the Hall of the Ancestors. Noxus, you pretty much go and just get dominated by a guy named Mordkaiser, which is, you know, that's, that's tough. Like, that's not the death realm you want. But uh, in Targon, they talk about the Marisol Magnum, which is a literal temple that comes from the spirit realm into the material realm during a special lunar event. The glade we're talking about now is in the spirit realm. The spirit realm is massive with infinite possibilities. It's almost a world in and of itself that's linked to the physical realm. Let's get back to Yordles. We've already discussed two Yordles who somehow made it to Runeterra. Those being Fizz, who resides in the oceans, and Nar in the Fraljord along with his family. So while Yordles today hail from Bandal City, this is not to say they all remain. They are able to journey from the spirit realm to the physical realm of Runeterra using otherworldly gateways. In the cinematic tales of Runeterra Don't Mess With Yordles, we see a branch of the Bandal Tree with portals going to Runeterra. The Yordles refer to these pathways leading to the portals as the Low Roads. The Low Roads that Yordles travel on don't run on the surface of this world, nor do they travel straight like those of men. They curve and loop, swirling all around the place like a crazy knot you can never untie. You can see this represented pretty well in Bandle Tail, a Riot Forge title, with the portal system being represented as a tangled ball of yarn. Although Bandle Tail is not hard canon, mortals would only ever accidentally stumble across these portal connections on Runeterra, as their positions can shift over time. Not to mention they only open under particular circumstances, or for those with the ability to read and interpret the language of the Yordles. There is one other way that a mortal, or really anything, could find its way to Bandle City, but we'll talk about that a little later. However, there are many pathways that do stay rooted in a single location. The magic of the spirit realm occasionally ebbs back and forth around such places, and these are known as Bandle Woods. The portals in these locations affect the local flora and fauna in strange, unpredictable ways. This is where the character at the beginning of our story walked into. Bandle Woods are certainly magical but not indestructible. In fact, a Yordle named Tristana witnessed the destruction of one of these Bandlewoods. The Bandlewoods are steeped in the magic of the gateways they grow around, giving Yordles a safe haven from the world. Tristana, dozing in the dappled sunshine, was shaken awake as the trees around her began to burn and topple. A war band of armored marauders rampaged through the woodland with fire and axes led by a sorcerer wreathed in dark energy. Tristana hid in horror. The sorcerer focused his power upon the portal at the heart of the Bandlewood, speaking one final utterance. Her ears still ringing with pain, Tristana watched the gateway collapse, never to be opened again. The ripples of that destruction were felt in Bandle City itself, causing great despair among the Yordles. 
Tristana had never experienced anything like the pain of this loss or the guilt she felt for not acting. Never again would she allow such a terrible thing to happen. In that moment, she dedicated herself to become the guardian of all Bandlewoods and her fellow Yordles. She had seen the black powder cannons of Bilgewater. Inspired by them, she collected enough precious metal discs to commission a gun suited to her diminutive size. With a wry smile, she named it Boomer. Since then, Tristana has defended the Bandlewoods from innumerable threats. Tristana has become something of a legend in Bandle City, and recently, a number of Yordles have started to imitate her, trying, and mostly failing, to copy her disciplined ways. Some have even had weapons mimicking Boomer constructed for them by the scrappy inventor Rumble. While Tristana finds this all rather embarrassing, she has come to the conclusion that if they are going to defend the pathways to Bandle City, they had better do it properly. As such, she has started training these new recruits, and they have adopted a new moniker, the Bandal Gunners. And while the Bandal Gunners are a significant group defending Bandal City, they are not the only one. There are also the Bandal Scouts, led by Timo. Though some say the existence of the Bandal Scouts is questionable, one thing is for certain. Timo's conviction is nothing to be trifled with. While most Yordles do not handle solo scouting missions with a great deal of finesse, Timo was remarkably efficient at them. His record of success in defending Bandle City from infiltrators easily makes him one of the most dangerous Yordles alive. His signature weapon, a blowgun, uses a rare Ajunta poison he personally gathers from the jungles of Komongu. To help cope with this lengthy period of isolation, Timo recently struck up a friendship with Tristana, a fellow member of Bandle City Special Forces. So, you have the Bandle City Special Forces, which contain the Bandle Gunners, who are really your soldiers, as well as the Bandle Scouts, who are your stealthy spy-like Yordles. Both work hand in hand to protect Bandle City. And protect it they must. For while the Bandle Woods may be threatened in the Material Realm, this is not to say there are no threats to Bandle City in the Spirit Realm. While we don't know really of a lot of attacks against Bandle City in the Spirit Realm, we do see one attack by a troll named Jean. And you better believe if a troll can find his way to Bandle City, creatures native to the Spirit Realm probably could as well and not all of them friendly. One that I'm thinking about is demons. Timo's lore does say that he has successfully defended Bandal City from infiltrators. Does this mean that he's defending the Bandalwood again, like Tristana, or is this directly in the spirit realm? We don't really know how connected these different areas are in the spirit realm, so could he be defending it from demons? While I know of no canonical event where demons outright attack Bandal City, I can see these two groups being almost opposites and opposing forces. We don't know as much about demons as we do Yordles, but they also find their way into Runeterra, such as Fiddlesticks and Tomkinch. Just like Yordles in most cases are driven by positive emotions, and almost are alive because of it. We can see that with Fizz when the entire city is destroyed and he falls into almost a coma, and his Yordle magic begins to fade. Demons are driven by the negative thoughts and feelings of mortals. Specifically, demons malign and manipulate victims to sate their own desires for suffering and each demon is attuned to a specific emotion, feeding on that. Fiddlesticks, for example, feeds on fear, while Tom Kench feeds on addiction and greed. Just like Yordles have this video where we go over what Yordles are, I think demons would need a whole separate video. But most Yordles come across, at least to me, as really hope and joy, and they value relationships and community ties. While there are a few outliers, who knows, maybe we'll come across a few outliers in the demons as well. But in terms of the base characteristics, I can imagine Yordles being difficult for a demon to deal with, and vice versa. So I wonder if the opposite relationship of these two races originating from the spirit realm will ever be explored more. But that's enough about demons of the spirit realm and their place on Runeterra. We may come back to them in a future video. Let's focus back on Bandle City. With regard to Bandle City itself, there is no official form of governance, although they do have a mayor. But no one recalls Bandal City ever appointing him, he was simply there one day. A plump Yordle with a funny hat who created this and pontificated that. Any who questioned his legitimacy soon forgot their concerns as he shook hands and twirled his magnificent stately mustache. The role is simply a self-appointed one with no actual political power or sway toward the Yordle inhabitants of the city. And with regard to notable objects in Bandal City, one you should know about is the Book of Thresholds. Remember how I was saying that there's another way for pretty much anyone to find a way to Bandle City? 
This is it. The Book of Thresholds is a powerful sentient artifact from Vandal City that allows the user to instantly travel almost anywhere depicted in its pages via a Yordle gateway system. It was created by a Yordle anthropologist long ago who wanted to study how Yordle magic works, and specifically, how Yordles travel between realms. It's been added to over the years by various enchantresses and sorcerers. Magical in nature, the book illustrates how to use gateways, where they are located, as well as the magical ley lines that cross the material and spirit realms. While primarily used to travel between Bandal City and Runeterra, its pages also contain all the Runeterra locations the gateways are connected to. Yumi the Cat is its current holder, in search of the book's original owner, the Yordle Enchantress Nora. Nora's story is actually very interesting. She didn't disappear with intention, she actually got lost. She dared to journey beyond the last page of the Book of Thresholds, and was thrown into a strange and distant realm. Her followers today are the beings she encounters in her journey through Realm's End, benevolent new friends, helping Nora find the right portal home. And she's not even the first Yordle to find Realm's End. That's actually Gaspar, the caretaker. He was the first Yordle to arrive in Realm's End, and for many years he wandered alone amidst the twisting paths and portals that all seemed to lead nowhere. Having decided that no one else should ever have to do the same, he now helps other lost travelers find their way home. And Realm's End is awesome, I could do a whole video just on that. It's a whole nother place connected to Runeterra. And the characters there seem really interesting. There's a Shane who was once a renowned tea maker before finding herself lost in Realm's End. The living library who considers it his duty to possess immense knowledge and collects tomes from various travelers who have passed through Realm's End. Unfortunately, all of his knowledge does appear to have gone to his head. There's the junk construct who'd only been born the day before Nora arrived, and he takes great pride in serving as her assistant. However, he does sternly insist on being referred to as junk and not trash, as the latter held a negative connotation. I think the Yordle Rumble would agree with him. But at Realm's End, it's an awesome place. You know, I would I would hope that in the Rider Memo we have a whole expansion exploring Realm's End. So currently Nora's stuck in Realm's End trying to find her way back to Yumi, and Yumi's working with the Book of Thresholds to find Nora. But I wonder, would the Book of Thresholds having sentience, how aware is it that Nora is in Realm's End? And could it actually send Yumi there and chooses not to, out of fear of Yumi also being trapped there? Or is the Book of Thresholds not aware of the realms beyond its pages? It's, it's interesting. I, I think the Book of Thresholds and Realm's End deserves and will be explored a lot more in the future. But the main concern with the Book of Threshold is that with this book, it is possible for anyone to easily access Bandle City or any location on Runeterra connected via the gateway system without the meticulous process of opening a gateway. The user would simply specify where they want to go. Then after the location was illustrated on the book's pages, the user would then dive into its glowing paper and arrive at their destination, joined a moment later by the book. The fact that a previous owner gave the book sentience to protect it from those who could use its power for evil makes sense. This book would give someone direct access not only to Bandle City but pretty much all of Runeterra. But that's enough about the spirit realm in Bandle City. What about Yordles who make their way to the material realm? While Yordles do leave Bandle City to dwell among mortals for a time, they generally return with fresh tales and new experiences to recount. Some travel back and forth between Bandle City and the material realm of Runeterra such as Tristana and Lulu while others take up more permanent residence in Runeterra, such as Heimerdinger who you see in Arcane, or Yops in the Riot Forge title Mage Seeker. In less enlightened parts of the world, a Yordle's appearance could seem frightening or unnatural to mortals. Speaking of appearances, they are from the spirit realm so their appearances can vary dramatically, although they don't seem to vary as much as demons or demigods of the Fraujord for example. With regard to age, I'm not sure why some Yordles seem older than others such as Gramps and Bandletail, although that game again is not hard canon. I do believe that the appearance of age may just be a choice that the Yordle makes, as Yordles do not age or die. However, due to their physiology they are vulnerable to being in prison inside cages made of runic iron. When a Yordle touches this iron, they get an electrical shock which disrupts their magic. You can see this in the Don't Mess With Yordle cinematic where Graves throws Timo in a runic cage and sparks spawn when he comes in contact with it. <laughs> I thought I struck gold when I got one Yordle. Now look what we got. You got. Don't care how much those Yordles are worth on the bounty board. They're a ticking time bomb of trouble. 
put your wine in and cage is runic iron. We also learn from this and other stories that yordles fetch a fairly high price in bilge water. But I tell you, you don't mess with yordles. I thought I was a gun. <laughs> there are other Yordles who have found permanent homes in Runeterra, such as Poppy and Demacia, Ken and Ionia, and even the Saddle Isles was appealing to a Yordle named Vex. All these Yordles felt that Bandle City was not the place for them for one reason or another, but found some place in Runeterra more suiting to their character. Although not all Yordles had great experiences finding homes in Runeterra. After the Great Darken War left the world in ruin many centuries ago, the only light that seemed to shine on Valoran came from the skies above. Scattered survivors looked to the heavens, and their renewed study of ancient celestial magic piqued the Yordle Vigar's interest. Imagining himself already a master of these mystical arts, the Yordle joined an order of mages in the Noxy territories, hoping to learn more of their craft, and he taught them to draw hope from the patterns created by the movements of the stars. But while many toiled to rebuild the world, others sought to conquer it. The brutal warlord Mordkaiser and his army swept across the land, crushing and enslaving any who would oppose his rule, and the mages of the order, unskilled in war, were of little value to this tyrant. Looming over them in his accursed battle plate, his keen eye fell upon Vigar, and Mordkaiser recognized the Yordle for what he truly was. He snatched him up in one iron gauntlet and dragged his prize away as the other mages were put to the sword. Imprisoned in the heart of the warlord's new monolithic fortress, Vigar was forced to turn his magic to dark purposes. Vigar performed grisly enchantments against his will, some strengthening his master's dominion over simply evoking terror for terror's sake. Vigar became a reluctant witness as Mordkaiser's vile deeds empowered him to near immortality. Vigar never knew, but eventually the Yordle's magic and appearance started to twist in response. Memories of his past faded. Why and how he came to Valoran? Where he had come from? Had he known any other life before this? Questions such as these weighed on his fragile mind. When the Revenant's warlord's own followers conspired against him, the nightmare of his reign was ended. But by this point, Vigar was nigh unrecognizable. His eyes blazed. Even his voice had become a sneer of malice. The darkness consumes you! He chose not to turn away from evil but to embrace it. He vowed to seize respect in the only way he could remember, through ruthless villainy. Inspiring fear in all who encountered him, he would call down the fury of the stars themselves upon his foes and trap them in the timeless infinite between moments. And yet, Viger could not quite find the same success as his former captor. For all his aspirations of evil doing, it seemed Viger would always come up just a tiny bit short. And that's pretty much all we know about Yordles. I find Vigar really interesting because he's kind of going against his nature. And the Yordles nature appears to be like hope and happiness and joy. And he's trying so hard to go against it and he comes up short every time. And I feel like it's a part of him that's intentionally sabotaging his own evil missions. The only one who really is different from that is Vex, who's in the Shadow Isles. I wonder if she'll come out of it eventually. It seems like she's the most skewed away from what a Yordle is meant to be. And it's interesting that all Yordles seem to be very similar. They all have those same characteristics, similar to demons, where they're all the same, but on the opposite side of the spectrum, where they're kind of feeding on fear and misery. And it almost seems like Yordles survive on the other side. Well, you can see that with Fizz when he kind of goes into a coma when there's so much sadness and destruction around him. So they're kind of opposing forces, like a demon gets stronger when everything is destruction and sadness and, and greed and misery, versus a Yordle gets stronger when there's hope and community ties and happiness and stuff like that. So we would probably align with the Yordles. But it's interesting to see Vex, who's kind of wants to see the world destroyed, and then maybe we'll see like a demon who's also more towards the Yordle side of the spectrum where they don't want to see fear and misery and whatnot. The last thing that I want to touch on are the Fey Folk. You'll see them a lot in Bandal City. You see one in Bandal Tail. He's an eggplant Fey Folk and he's actually a member of the Bandal Scouts. And you see them a lot in a lot of Legends of Runeterra are they're also cards by themselves. They're definitely from the spirit realm and specifically they interact a lot with the Yordles. They're basically like eggplants. They even grow out of the ground it seems as a face. They start out as a face sprout and you water them and eventually you get these big guys. 
But the, the spirit realm itself is very interesting with all the different realms. I wonder if realms end is another realm of the spirit realm or if it's something entirely different. We don't know too much about realms end other than it's a place that some people get stuck in, but it's definitely a place I want to explore more. If you're looking for more Yordle, I'd recommend playing Bandletail. I love all the Riot Forge titles. Bandletail is a great one. It's a game you want to just take slow though, you know, make a cup of tea at night, sit down and just play it a little bit. It's a chill game. Last thing I want to say is I put a ton of work into these videos and I really appreciate all the support I've been getting, especially on the last few. Uh, you just watching the video this long is honestly a huge help. Liking, commenting, subscribing is massive. And a special shout out to those who became members of the channel. You can see their names on the screen now. I would love to be able to invest even more time into these videos, produce more videos, perhaps stream. And that definitely goes a long way to making that dream a reality. So thank you so much. Thanks for stopping by the Grove and I'll see you in the next one.